Thank you. Thanks. We have spent three lectures reflecting on the understanding of God implicit in our liturgical acts of addressing God. God, so I have argued, is implicitly understood in these acts as listening to us and hearing favorably what we say, doing so in the course of bringing about God's kingdom. It's time that we turn our attention to the other main type of liturgical action. In the enactment of almost all liturgies, the people do a good deal of listening to what is said to them. In the enactment of some Protestant liturgies, they do little else. That a good deal of the enactment of a liturgy consists of the congregants listening to what is said to them is not immediately evident, however, from the printed script for a traditional liturgy. Extended listening occurs when the sermon is preached, but usually all that one finds in the printed script for the liturgy is the rubric sermon or homily. When the congrega congregants listen to what is said to them, they are obviously listening to what is said by one of their fellow human beings, their priests, their minister, a reader of scripture, a leader for the prayers. But in my third lecture, I referred to a tradition of liturgical theology, which holds that in a good many of our liturgical acts of listening, we are listening to what God said or says to us by way of what some human being says. As an example of the point, I cited the discussion of the matter by the Swiss liturgical scholar, Jean-Jacques Phenomen. All Christians agree, says Phenomen, that the word of God is an essential constituent of Christian worship. Without it, the cult would not be a living encounter between God and his people, but a mere human dialogue or monologue. It would not be a miracle but rather a blind groping, longing, or despair. The cult would be emptied of its substance and indistinguishable from a non-Christian cult. Recall that von Allman distinguished three basic ways in which the word of God is proclaimed in the liturgy. There's the proclamation that occurs when scripture is read, the proclamation that occurs when the sermon is preached, and the proclamation that occurs when the minister pronounces the opening greeting the absolution, and the closing benediction. Phenomenon calls these respectively an agnostic proclamation, scripture, prophetic proclamation, and clerical proclamation. I judge that phenomenon is surely mistaken in saying that all Christians agree that an enactment of the liturgy is, quote, a living, effective encounter between God and his people by virtue of our listening to what God says to us in these various forms of proclamation. Perhaps all liturgical scholars agree on this, I'm not sure. But surely not all Christians agree. Indeed, it can safely be said that most Christians in the contemporary world do not. They believe that when we repeat some liturgical act of, perform some liturgical act of listening, we're listening to nothing more than what some fellow human being has to say about God, Christ, scripture, love, forgiveness, and so forth. So once again, we are confronted with the fact that disagreement and controversy arises already at the first of the three stages that I distinguished in the formation of liturgical theology, the stage in which we try to determine what's going on in some liturgical act. I propose not entering that controversy on this occasion. Instead, I shall assume that Van Allman is right. By way of the reading of scripture, the preaching of the sermon, and the clerical pronouncement of the opening greeting, the absolution and the closing benediction, God speaks to the people and they listen to what God said or says. In an enactment of the liturgy, we address the God of unsurpassable greatness who is bringing about his kingdom. And God stoops down to listen to us and to hear favorably what we say. And God also stoops down to speak to us and we listen and we listen to what God says. The understanding of God implicit in the liturgy is that God, God is one who both listens and speaks. But how are we to understand this idea of God speaking to us? That is the topic I will be wrestling with in this lecture. How can we best develop theologically the idea that God speaks to us in the liturgy? The topic of this lecture thus falls into the third of the three stages that I distinguished in the formation of liturgical theology.
the stage in which we try to give theological articulation to the understanding of God that we identify as implicit in the liturgy. My strategy will be to present to you two quite different ways of developing the idea of God as one who speaks, in particular as one who speaks in the enactment of the liturgy. On one way of developing the idea, the minister is a deputy of God. He or she speaks on behalf of God, in the name of God, so that his or her speaking counts as God here and now saying something to these particular people. This is clearly John Calvin's understanding of what happens in preaching. Speaking of the ecclesiastical office of minister, he says that God, quote, uses the ministry of men, human beings, to declare openly his will to us by mouth as a sort of delegated work. Not by transferring to them his, his own right and honor, but only that through their mouths he may do his own work, just as a workman uses a tool to do his work. In another passage, God declares his regard for us when, from among human beings, he takes some to serve as his ambassadors in the world, ambassadors, to be interpreters of his secret will, and in short, to represent his person. And just a bit later, Calvin refers to the minister as a puny human being, risen from the dust, who speaks in God's name. Very clearly the deputy, ambassadorial understanding of preaching. In one passage, Phenomenon follows Calvin in speaking of the minister as an ambassador of God and as representing God. But this is an exception in Phenomenon's discussion. In all other passages, he speaks instead, not of the minister speaking on behalf of God or ambassador or deputy, he speaks instead of the minister as proclaiming the word of God, meaning by the word of God, Christ. The minister proclaims Christ. That's a different idea from speaking as a deputy of God. About the clerical proclamation in general, Van Almond says that the minister, by means of a biblical formula, declares and gives to the people the greeting, the absolution, and the blessing of God. That sentence by itself could be understood along Calvinist lines, I guess. But that phenomenon doesn't intend it to be so understood becomes clear just a bit later when he, when he asks, what takes place in this clerical proclamation of the word of God at the pronouncement of the greeting, the absolution, and the blessing? And to that question, his answer is, Clearly an event that is brought about by divine grace, the word of God, Christ, perhaps even more than when it is proclaimed in a prophetic manner, comes into efficacious action with all the power of the Spirit. Notice, nothing is said there about the minister functioning as an ambassador or representative or deputy of God. The minister proclaims Christ, the word of God. And on the occasion of that proclamation, the event occurs of Christ coming into efficacious action through the power of the Spirit. About the blessing in particular, Phenomenon says that it is the creative and efficacious Word of God. Remember, all the way through, Word of God is Christ. It is the creative and efficacious Word of God which is then uttered. And that is why those moments of the service when this Word resounds are particularly fraught with spiritual power. The blessing is a word charged with power in which God himself transmits to persons, living beings or things, salvation, welfare, and the joy of living, and the same power is operative in the greeting and the absolution. Once again, the point is becoming repetitious. Nothing is said about the minister functioning as an ambassador of God. Nothing about the minister speaking on behalf of God. The minister utters the word of God, that is Christ. And on the occasion of that utterance, the event occurs of God transmitting salvation to the hearers. About the sermon phenomenon says that in the hands of God, the sermon is a basic means by which there takes place a direct prophetic intervention in the life of the faithful and of the church. Preaching prevents the petrifaction of the word of God and the then and there of the event in which it was enshrined, of its coming in Jesus Christ and makes that then and there newly operative in the here and now. Actually, he's got Latin here. Elicantunc and hicat nunc 
Preaching is the prophetic word of the church, mediating, mediating and guaranteeing the presence of Christ. Notice, yet once more, <laughs> that there's not even a hint of Calvin's idea of the minister as speaking in the name of God. As Van Allen sees it in prophetic proclamation, that is sermon, the minister proclaims the word of God, that is Christ. And on that occasion, the event occurs of Christ becoming present and operative. At the beginning of his discussion of church proclamation, Van Allman remarks that, quote, since we are dealing with liturgy and not systematic theology, I may be excused from including here a theology of the word of God. End of quote. Be that as it may, that he doesn't want to get into theology, there can be no doubt that in his understanding of how God speaks in the enactment of the liturgy, Phenomenon is operating with a highly distinctive theology of God as speaking, namely, that of his fellow Swiss Reformed theologian, Karl Barth. Several times he explicitly refers to and quotes from Barth. Phenomenon was not idiosyncratic on this point. Especially in Protestant circles, Barth's development of the idea of God as speaker was, and I judge remains, enormously influential. So we have no choice but to turn to Bart. Bart's theology of God as speaker is complex. It's going to take um, a number of pages, minutes, to get hold of just its basic contours. Karl Bart was less sparing of words than any other theologian of the Christian church. <laughs> with uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, his contemporary, his Catholic contemporary, not all that far behind. In the expansive two-volume prolegomena to his massive church dogmatics, Karl Barth developed his now famous doctrine concerning the threefold form of the Word of God. <coughs> the Word of God revealed in Jesus Christ, the Word of God written in Scripture, and the Word of God proclaimed in the church. Our goal is to consider what Bart had to say about the word of God as proclaimed in the church. But we can't get there without first looking at what he had to say about the other two forms of the word of God. To turn to Bart's discussion of Jesus Christ as the word of God, after engaging as we did last Thursday, N.T. Wright's presentation of the story told by the four gospels, concerning Jesus and the victory of God, to turn to Bart after right, is to be struck by several points of sharp contrast. It is to be struck for one thing by the extraordinary abstractness of Bart's discussion. We took note of Wright's observation that the Nicene and Apostles' creeds take us straight from incarnation to crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. The creeds say nothing about the life of Jesus and of what he did and said. Bart likewise says almost nothing about the life of Jesus in, these, in the prolegomena. And though the three events of crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension are indispensable components of his teaching, they take distinctly second place to incarnation. At the center of Bart's discussion is, quote, the fact that God's word became a man, human being, and that this man has become God's word. What also strikes one, or at least strikes me, after turning to Bart after reading Tom Wright, is that the theme that Wright identifies as the overarching theme in the Gospels, that of God becoming king and Jesus the Messiah, that theme plays a vanishingly small role in Bart's discussion. Bart's entire discussion is shaped instead by an idea that plays a relatively minor role in scripture itself, namely the idea of God revealing himself. For Bart, the fundamental significance of the, of the Incarnation is that therein, and only therein, God is revealed. Quote, God's revelation is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. To say revelation is to say the Word became flesh. Unless there be any doubt as to what he means by revelation, Bart explains that revelation is, I quote, the, veiling, the unveiling of what is veiled. <laughs> 
in the incarnation, God, who had previously been hidden from human beings, unveiled himself by taking on our nature and dwelling among us. And the New Testament, like the Old Testament, is the witness to this revelation of the hidden God. A concept of revelation that has often been employed in the Christian tradition and continues to be employed in some quarters is that of so-called propositional revelation. God's revelation consists of God causing certain persons to believe certain propositions about God. Bart is abruptly dismissive of the idea. Revelation, he remarks, is not to be dissolved into a sum total of truths, which are then propounded to us as truths of faith, salvation, and revelation. Revelation is the revelation of God himself, not of some propositions about God. Quote, the freely acting God himself and alone is the truth of revelation. God's revelation is not to be compared to someone reve revealing some secrets about himself to another person, but is to be compared to someone revealing himself by coming out of concealment from behind a screen or whatever. <laughs> An obvious question to raise here is how Bart proposes to deal with the biblical declaration that the heavens declare the glory of God and that creation in general manifests God's wisdom, power, and fidelity. How does he deal with what earlier I call God's creational glory? Does he deny that God's glory is revealed in God's creation? Contrary to what one, well, one I would have expected, Nowhere in his extensive discussion of Revelation in the two-volume prolegomena does Bart directly address the matter. I think we can surmise, however, what he would say were the question put to him. Whereas the creation shows or manifests various attributes of God, glory, wisdom, power, fidelity, and so forth, and Jesus Christ God himself is revealed, not just some attributes of God, I take it that's what he was getting at in the following passage. Quote, in the death of Jesus, God reveals his divine person, his divine essence, in distinction from the nature of divinity in general or the divine forms in which this is seen and reverenced. God himself is needed to reveal this work and especially to reveal himself, his divine person and essence. Who but God could or would reveal God? Revelation is no more and no less than the life of God himself turned to us. If this is in fact what Bart would say in answer to my question, my response is that though there is indeed a distinction to be drawn between various attributes of God being revealed in creation and God himself being revealed in Jesus Christ, to draw the distinction is not to justify limiting the application of the term revelation to the latter, and even less is it to justify neglect of the revelation of God in creation. But back to what Bart has to say about Jesus Christ as God's revelation. In revealing himself by becoming incarnate in Jesus Christ, God speaks, says Bart. God says something. Revelation, in this case, is also speech. And Bart insists that, quote, we have no reason not to take the concept of God's word primarily in its literal sense. God's word mean that, means that God speaks. Speaking is not a symbol. And there he has a reference to Paul Tillich. It is not a designation and description. Oh, the concept of the word of God means originally and irrevocably that God speaks. Okay. And what does God say in revealing himself be, by becoming incarnate in Jesus Christ? God says, God with us. Bart amplifies that crisp summary, which he repeats every now and then, by distinguishing between what God says by way of command and what God says by way of promise. What God says by way of command is the following. Quote, God's word means in this context God's positive command which lifts us up and controls us as a command that goes forth in a way we cannot foresee and to which we can only take up an attitude by repeating it as we think we have heard it. 
and by trying to conform to it as well as we can. It is God's own direction. And what God says by way of promise is the following, quote, the promise given to the church in this word, that is the word being Christ, is the promise of God's mercy, which is uttered in the person of him who is very God and very man, and which takes up our cause when we could not help ourselves at all because of our enmity against God. Bart declares that God's promise is uttered in the person of him who is very God and very man. He would say the same, of course, about God's command. It too is uttered in the person of him who is very God and very man. And what I find noteworthy about that emphatic declaration is that the words actually spoken by Jesus pretty much, pretty much fall out of the picture. No doubt Bart did believe that in Jesus of Nazareth speaking, God was speaking. Not speaking by way of words spoken by someone other than God, but God himself speaking. Yet in his, remark, in his account of God speaking in the two volumes of the Prolegomena, Bart makes remarkably few references to what Jesus actually said. And this is part of what makes for the extreme abstractness of the discussion. For Bart, God speaks primarily in the person of Jesus Christ, that is, in and by the incarnation as such. In one passage, he says about Jesus that, in a way different from Israel's prophets, he is not there to receive and transmit the word of the Lord, but he speaks himself. In fact, he is this word, doesn't speak that word, but is this word. He accomplishes a plenipotentiary representation of God in which God himself is the witness for man. That was about the first form of the word of God. Um, God's word in revelation in Jesus Christ. So let's move on to the second of the three forms of the word of God. Unlike those who saw and heard Jesus in the flesh, you and I have no direct access to that speech of God, which is God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. Our access is only indirect, in fact, mediated by scripture. The overarching category that Bart uses for the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament is that of witness. They were witnesses to Jesus Christ, the word of God. Witness, witnessing, he says, means pointing in a specific direction beyond the self and on to another. Witnessing is a service which consists in referring to the other. And this service is constitutive for the concept of the prophet and also for that of the apostle. The Old Testament is the written deposit of the prophetic witness. The New Testament is the written deposit of the apostolic witness. A number of things, I think, deserve to be emphasized here. First, as Bart repeatedly insists, the written deposit of a witness to revelation is not itself the revelation. The Bible is not God's revelation. A real witness is not identical with that to which it witnesses, but it sets it before us. Quotation, in the Bible, we meet with human words written in human speech. And in these words, and therefore by means of them, we hear of the lordship of the triune God. Therefore, when we have to do with the Bible, we have to do primarily with this means, with these words, with the witness, which as such is not itself revelation, but only, and this is the limitation, the witness to it. Second, a witness is not a deputy. There is both a passive side and an, act, and an active side to the prophetic and apostolic witness. Having been witnesses of God's revelation in Jesus Christ, the prophets and apostles then, then become in turn witnesses to that revelation. Their words and actively witnessing to that revelation are purely human. They do not speak on behalf of God. Nobody speaks on behalf of God. That is, no human being speaks on behalf of God. 
Further, though the Holy Spirit superintends both the witness, witnessing of revelation by the prophets and apostles, and their witnessing to revelation, so that their words do genuinely present God's revelation to us, the Spirit does not superintend their witnessing in such a way as to prevent all error and to rub out all human particularity. I quote, the prophets and apostles as such, even in their office, even in their function as witnesses, even in the act of writing down their witness, were real historical men guilty of error in their spoken and written word. Every time we turn the word of God into an infallible biblical word of man, or the biblical word of man into an infallible word of God, we resist that which we ought never to resist. That is, the truth of the miracle, that here fallible men speak the word of God in fallible human words. And the scope of error, on Bart's view, extends even to the theological and ethical views of the biblical writers. Third, I think there are visible signs of strain when Bart, having identified God's revelation with Jesus Christ, tries to fit not only the New Testament writers, but also the Old Testament writers under the category of witnesses to revelation. We find him saying, for example, in one passage, revelation in the Old Testament is really the expectation of revelation or expected revelation. And in another passage, the Old Testament covenant is the revelation of God is thus specially defined insofar as being so defined, it is expectation of the revelation of Jesus Christ. To expect some revelation is not to witness that revelation. I have no idea why Bart was so determined to squeeze the prophets along with the apostles under the single category of witness. There may well be people in this room who can explain that to me in the question period uh, afterwards. Fourth, notice that Bart has committed himself to the contestable claim that everything in scripture, including the wisdom literature, is to be read as part of a story, and that that story has a single storyline, namely the storyline of redemption. The story first of Israel is expecting the occurrence of God's revelation, then, the occur then of the occurrence of that revelation, and finally of the church recollecting that occurrence. The Bible is unified, Bart insists, not by a unified theology or a unified worldview, but by the fact that all its parts point in one way or another to Jesus Christ. To understand the Bible from beginning to end, from verse to verse, I'm quoting, is to understand how everything in it relates to this Deus Dixit, God said, as this invisible, visible center. I call that claim contestable. I am myself attracted to the alternative view that my erstwhile scholar, uh, colleague at Yale, David Kelsey, has worked out in what I regard as his magisterial book on anthro theological anthropology that he calls eccentric existence. The view that in scripture, this is Kelsey's view, we, th we find three independent but interacting storylines as to how the triune God relates to all that is not God. The storyline of creation and preservation, the storyline of redemption, and the storyline of consummation. But obviously this is not the occasion for me to defend Kelsey against Bart. One more point of exposition before we can move on to what Bart has to say about church proclamation. Bart is emphatic in his insistence that the Bible is not God's word. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is God's word, God's speech. Had the prophets and apostles been deputized to speak on behalf of God, then in the deposit of their speech, we would discern what God said to those whom the prophets addressed. But they were not on Bart's view deputies. They were no more than witnesses to what God said, specifically to Jesus Christ. Bart's deep principle is this, God speaks by way of a human being only if God is that human being. But Bart does wish to say something more about the relation of the Bible to the Word of God 
than that it is the deposit of those who are witnesses of and witnesses to the word of God, that is Christ. He's, now and then, he, he says that, now and then, that is, Bart says that, now and then, here and there, the Bible becomes God's word. It becomes God's word, he says, to the extent that God causes it to be his word, to the extent that he speaks through it. The Bible, and I quote again, becomes God's, becomes God's word, now, you ought to have echoing in your ears that Jesus Christ alone is God's word, right? Okay. The Bible, quote, becomes God's word in this event. And in the statement that the Bible is God's word, the little word is refers to its being in this becoming. The little word is does not refer to identity. The Bible is not identical with God's word. Whether now and then, here and there, it becomes God's word is God's decision and not ours. What is Bart driving at? When after all he said before, he now says that here and there, now and then, God speaks to us through the Bible. And that in that event, the Bible, to quote, becomes God's word. In another passage, Bart says of the Bible itself, that now and then, here and there, it speaks to us. Not that God speaks to us through it, but that it becomes God's word. Quote, the presence of the word of God itself, the real and present speaking and hearing of it, is not identical with the existence of the book itself, he means the Bible. But in this presence, something takes place in and with the book, for which the book as such does indeed give the possibility but the reality of which cannot be anticipated or replaced by the existence of the book. A free divine decision is made. It then comes about that the Bible, the Bible in concreto, that is, in this or that biblical context, the Bible as it comes to us in this or that specific measure, it then comes about that the Bible is taken up and used as an instrument in the hand of God, that is, it speaks to us and is heard by us as the authentic witness to divine revelation and is therefore present as the word of God. That is, the Bible is present as the word of God. I suggest that when Bart says that now and then, here and there, the Bible speaks to us, he means the same as when he says that God now and then speaks to us through the Bible. And what he means by that latter becomes clear in turn in the following passages. For men acquainted with God's word through revelation, scripture and proclamation, God's word can and must become true in such a way that its truth becomes their own, that is the recipient, the, the, the hearer's own, and they become responsible witnesses to its truth. Another passage, they must be determined by the word of God in their existence that is in the totality of their self-determination. Their revelation, another passage, must become the relation of acknowledgement. The person who so hears the Bible that he or she grasps and accepts its promises believes. And this grasping and accepting of the promise, a manual with us sinners in the word of the prophets and apostles, this is the faith of the church. Faith in the promise of the prophetic and apostolic word is an event and is to be understood only as an event. In this event of accepting it in faith, the Bible becomes God's word. In short, when Bart says that now and then, here and there, God speaks to us through the Bible, he does not mean that on those occasions God says to us something other than what he has already said in Jesus Christ. He means that God uses our reading of the Bible to evoke in us faith in the one to whom the Bible witnesses, namely Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And when he says that on occasion the Bible becomes the Word of God, which is not something you'd expect given all that he's <laughs> said before, he means, as a sort of somewhat figurative way, he means that he means the same thing. On occasion, God uses, uses the reading of the Bible to evoke faith in us. Awesome. 
Well, after all of that, we are now finally in the position of being able to consider what Bart says about the third form of the Word of God, namely the Word of God as preached in the church. The present day preacher stands in a line of succession with the ancient prophets and apostles. One and all they present or point to Jesus Christ. What makes this succession possible, as we have seen, is Holy Scripture, the deposit of what was once proclamation by human lips. I quote, the church can say anything at all about the event of God and man, that is the incarnation, Jesus Christ, only because something unique has taken place between God and these specific people who were witnesses. And because in what they wrote, or what was written by them, they confront us as living documents of that unique event. But though the prophets, together with the present day preacher, are to be set initially under a single genus, Jeremiah and Paul at the beginning, and the modern preacher of the gospel at the end of one and the same series. The role of the present day preacher in that series is, in Bart's view, as you would guess, decisively different from that of the prophets and apostles. The role of the prophets and apostles is primary. They were witnesses of the revelation. The role of the preacher is secondary. His or her pres presentation of Jesus Christ is dependent on and governed by their witness. Quote, Christian preaching is speaking about God in the name of Jesus Christ. It is a human activity like any other. End of quote. On the basis of the witness of the prophets and apostles, it both points, preaching both points back to the word of God and points forward to the future coming of the word of God. In the former of these functions, it is repetition. Repetition is Bart's word. The discharge of preaching cannot be God's own word as such, but only the repetition of his promise. Repetition of the promise, lo, I am with you always. But more takes place in authentic preaching than the human activities of recollecting and pointing forward to Jesus Christ, the word of God. What also occurs is the self-proclamation of the word of God. Preachers in all their humanity are invited to share in God's own work of proclaiming his word. Again, God commits himself with his eternal word to the preaching of the church in such a way that this preaching is not merely a proclamation of human ideas and convictions, but like the existence of Jesus Christ, like the testimony of the prophets and apostles on which it is founded and by which it lives, is God's own proclamation. So preaching is also God's own proclamation. It does not happen automatically that when the church speaks of God, God himself will and does speak of himself. When human talk about God is for us not just that, but also in, not just human speech, but also in primarily and decisively God's own speech, that's a miracle. About that miracle of not just the human being presenting Jesus Christ on the basis of scriptures, but God proclaiming God's self. The miracle of real proclamation does not consist in the fact that the willing and the doing of proclaiming men with all his conditioning and in all of his promises his problems is set aside that in some way a disappearance of those of the, of the minister takes place and a gap arises in the reality of nature and that in some way there steps into this gap naked divine reality no 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 the miracle consists in the fact that by means of the human words of the preacher God speaks about himself. Not just the preacher speaking about Jesus Christ, but God speaks about himself by means of the human words of the preacher. When the church speaks of God, God himself will and does speak of himself. That last sentence makes it sound as if the speech of the preacher is merely the temporal occasion of God speaking. I think it's pretty clear to Bart's view, however, it's not just the temporal occasion, but it's the means, as he sometimes calls it, 
as he sometimes calls it, it's the instrument. Now, I know of no place in which Barth explains what he has in mind when he refers to the divine self-proclamation that occurs by means of the preacher's speech. However, I think it's almost certain that he means the same thing as what he means when he says that God speaks to us by means of the Bible. He does not mean that God says something new and different from what God has already said in Jesus Christ. He means that God uses the preacher's speech to evoke faith in us. Faith in the one to whom the preacher points, namely Jesus Christ, the word of God. Recall that he says of the Bible that it must continually become God's word. By which he means that it, we must continually trust it, have faith. To become the word of God, he says the same thing of church proclamation. It too must be continually become God's word. To become the word of God is for listeners to be determined by the word of God that is, Jesus Christ in their existence, that is, in the totality of their self-determination. So running throughout, what I've been trying to emphasize is, is a relentless theme. God speaks only in Jesus Christ, and only God speaks for God. The Bible can become God's word, preaching can become God's word, God's word in the sense that we trust it, have faith in it, receive it. So let's review where we are in our discussion. I observe that in the enactment of almost all Christian liturgies, the people do a good deal of listening to what is said to them. I then said that the idea I wanted to explore was the idea, common among liturgical scholars, that in much of this listening, the people are not only listening to the words of some human being, but listening to what God says or said to them. God is implicitly understood as one who speaks to the people in the enactment of the liturgy. And the question I pose for this lecture is how to develop, articulate, theologically, this understanding of God implicit in the liturgy. I pointed to Calvin as someone who held that in church proclamation, the minister speaks in God's name, speaks on behalf of God. The minister is an ambassador of God, a deputy, a representative. I'm not aware of any place in which Calvin develops the idea. In the course of his discussion of the Eucharist, Calvin notes that yet something more takes place in the sermon than, than that God speaks to the congregants by way of the preacher's words. Christ, he says, offers himself to them. I'm going to save my discussion of this additional note, God offering himself in addition to God speaking for my next lecture. After taking note of Calvin's understanding of church proclamation, I went on to note that we find a very different understanding of church proclamation in the 20th century liturgical scholar Jean-Jacques von Allman. Even though as a minister in the Swiss Reformed Church, von Allman stands in the tradition of which Calvin was one of the founders. Rather than saying that the minister speaks on behalf of God or in the name of God, von Allman describes the minister as proclaiming the word of God, that is, proclaiming Jesus Christ. Von Allman declined to develop this idea on the ground that he was not a theologian but a liturgist. There can be no doubt, however, that his understanding of God's speaking had been shaped by the theology of Karl Barth. Between von Allman and John Calvin, there stands Karl Barth. So we turn to Barth, with the aim of discovering Barth's understanding of God as speaker. The systematic sweep and intricacy of Barth's proposal and its theological brilliance and boldness are extraordinary. But here now is Barth's view stripped to the bones. Jesus Christ is the word of God. There is no other word of God than the word spoken in Jesus Christ. In church proclamation, the preacher on the basis of scripture presents to the congregants that word of God, namely Jesus Christ. The preacher does not speak on behalf of God. Conversely, God does not speak by way of the preacher's speech. 
No one speaks on behalf of God, no human being. In the speech of Jesus of Nazareth, God spoke, but Jesus did not speak on behalf of God. Jesus was God. The action of the preacher with respect to God speaking is purely presentational, purely ostensive. The preacher points to Jesus Christ, the Word of God. However, if things go as they're meant to go, something else happens when the preacher proclaims Jesus Christ, the Word of God. The miracle occurs of the Word of God proclaiming itself by means of the preacher's speech. Though Bart does not explain what he means by this surprising reference to divine self-proclamation, almost certainly what he means is that the Holy Spirit employs the preacher's proclamation of the Word of God, Jesus Christ, to evoke in the congregant's faith in Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And Bart speaks of that event as the sermon becoming the Word of God. Notice now that on this view, God does not literally speak by way of the enactment of the liturgy. And we do not literally hear God speaking. To employ what someone says to effect something in someone is not to speak, that is not to perform an illocutionary act. Recall our discussion in the fourth lecture of speaking. By enunciating the words, it's raining, I can assert that it's raining. The act of enunciating the words, it's raining, is not to be identified with the act of asserting that it's raining, since, since each of these can be performed without performing the other. In speech act theory, the former, the enunciation of the words, is standardly called the locutionary act, and the latter is standardly called an illocutionary act. One performs the illocutionary act by performing the locutionary act, but the connection is not causal. The locutionary act doesn't have the causal power of causing the illocutionary act. The connection is the non-causal connection of the one counting as the other. One's performance of the locutionary act counts as one's performance of the illocutionary act. Enunciating the words, it's raining, counts as asserting that it's raining. God's effecting faith in the hearers by means of the words of the preacher is not the same thing as God performing some illocutionary act of speaking to the hearers by way of the words of the preacher. Though in my view it's a mark against the Barkian view that God does not literally speak by way of what the preacher says, but only causes a certain effect, I can see that by itself it's not a decisive mark. Perhaps there are good reasons for holding that in the enactment of the liturgy, God does not literally speak. It speaks only in an extended sense. In short, I take it the question remains open, who's right, Calvin or Bart? An initial question to consider is whether the idea of a human being speaking on behalf of God is even conceptually coherent. Is this a possibility? I hold that it is. In my book, Divine Discourse, I explored at considerable length the phenomenon of what I call double agency discourse. That is the phenomenon of one person speaking on behalf of another. Those Though to the best of my knowledge, you will not find any discussion of double agency discourse in standard speech act theory writings, it is nonetheless a common phenomenon. Ambassadors speak on behalf of their heads of state, lawyers speak on behalf of their clients, and so forth. In my book, Divine Discourse, after exploring the general phenomenon of double agency discourse, I then went on to develop the idea of a human being speaking on behalf of God, and the correlative idea of God then speaking by way of the speech of that human being. In the book, I did, did not defend the claim that this does sometimes happen. As a, as a philosopher, I contented myself with defending the claim that it could happen, that it was coherent. So the Calvinist interpretation of liturgical proclamation cannot be ruled out on the ground that it is conceptually incoherent. Now, to say it once again, the theological conviction that shapes Barth's entire theology of God as speaker, 
is that God's speech is confined to what God says in the person and words of Jesus Christ. An implication of this conviction being that no human being speaks on behalf of God except Jesus of Nazareth, who is, of course, God. In my presentation of Bart, I did not give any reason that Bart gives for this conviction of his, which shapes his entire discussion. I did not do so because Bart gives no reason, at least none that I've ever been able to discover. The conviction functions in his discussion as an unquestioned, to the best of my knowledge, never defended assumption. There are some rather vague intimations here and there to the effect that Bart thinks it would be an infringement on God's freedom were God to allow human beings to speak on behalf of God. But I know of no place in which those vague intimations are clearly stated and certainly none in which they are developed. And I, at least, don't see how they could be plausibly developed. Why exactly is that an infringement on God's freedom? I find Bart's claim biblically untenable that what God says is confined to what God says in Jesus Christ and that no human being other than Jesus speaks on behalf of God. It seems to me that the prophets are consistently presented in Scripture as speaking on behalf of God, in the name of God. Six times over, the prophet Amos pronounces words of judgment on the nations surrounding Israel each time prefacing his highly specific words of judgment with the phrase, thus says the Lord. And then he turns around to pronounce words of judgment on Israel and on Judah. In each of these cases, also prefacing his words of judgment with the phrase, thus says the Lord. The prophet is presented not as a mere instrument of God speaking, but as speaking on behalf of God, in the name of God so that by the words of judgment spoken by the prophet, God pronounces judgment on the nations, on Israel and on Judah. The audible words of judgment are spoken by the prophet, but by way of the prophet's enunciation of those words, God himself pronounces judgment. It is God who is judging the nations, Israel and Judah, not the prophet. We know how Bart would respond. The prophet is not speaking on behalf of God. Conversely, God is not pronouncing judgments, highly specific judgments, I might add, on the nations Israel and Judah by way of the prophet's deliverance of words of judgment. Rather, the prophet is pointing to Jesus Christ, the word of God. Let me make two comments about this Bartian response. First, I find it extremely implausible to hold that the prophets were doing no more than pointing to the Messiah, the Messiah being Jesus Christ, the Word of God. It's true, of course, that the prophetic words spoken by Amos and the other prophets were uttered within the context of eschatological expectations concerning the coming of a Messiah. But the contents of the judgment spoken by Amos and the other prophets are not to be identified with that eschatological context. In verse 13 of the first chapter of the book of Amos, we read these words. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have ripped up women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their borders. I just don't see how this highly specific judgment pronounced by God by way of Amos on the Ammonites can be identified with what God says to all humanity in the Incarnation. It is, of course, connected to what God says to all humanity in Jesus Christ. But it's not just God with us. I personally find Bart's interpretation of the prophets to be a radical reduction of the concrete specificity of the prophetic proclamations. Secondly, I think Bart does not take seriously the words of the prophet, thus says the Lord. The prophets have often been interpreted not as speaking on behalf of God, but as delivering to their hearers convictions that God had planted in them, in their minds. On this interpretation, the words of judgment pronounced by the prophets are to be understood as prefaced with the words, let me convey to you what God has communicated to me. 
And this is not substantially different from Bart's interpretation, according to which the prophet conveys to his hearers what God has led him to believe that God says in Jesus Christ. Now, in some cases, I think the right interpretation is that the prophets conveyed to their hearers what God had said to them. In those cases, they were functioning as reporters of divine speech, functioning as publicists. But that's not the natural way of reading those bold words of Amos, thus says the Lord. Those who heard those words were not, were not hearing a report of what God had previously said to Amos privately, but were hearing God then and there pronouncing judgment on them. Now, of course, the fact that Scripture presents the prophets, and also I would argue the apostles, as speaking on behalf of God and in the name of God, does not imply that we should understand church proclamation along the same lines. That remains an open question. May it be that the phenomenon of human beings speaking on behalf of God was confined to the prophets and the apostles and then ended. But the question like this. Bart holds that the present day preacher should be understood as standing in the same line as the prophets and apostles. Just as they pointed to Jesus Christ, the word of God, so also the preacher points to Jesus Christ, the word of God. Now suppose we hold that the prophets and apostles did not merely point to Jesus Christ, but also spoke on behalf of God. Should we nonetheless embrace the Bartian view of church proclamation, that the present day pe preacher points to Jesus Christ, but not, does not speak on behalf of God? Should we embrace that kind of discrepancy between prophecy and preaching? The basic issue as I see it is the following. In one passage, Bart, after insisting that church proclamation is not some new word invented by the preacher, <clears throat> but repetition of the divine promise, adds that this repetition, quote, cannot consist in the mere reading of scripture or in repeating and paraphrasing the actual wording of the biblical witness. This can only be its presupposition. So he doesn't mean repetition literally. The preacher, he says, must be ready to make the promise given to the church in scripture, intelligible in his own words to the men of his own time. So proclamation occupies, quote, the middle space between the particular text and the context of the whole Bible and the particular situation of the changing moment. So far, no problem. The preacher has to present Jesus Christ to the congregants in such a way that the divine promise comes through to them and that requires that the preacher not just quote scripture, but speak in the language of the people listening. Okay, but then Bart goes on to say the following, quote, wherever and whenever God speaks to man, human beings, his content is a concretissimum, is a most concrete thing. God always has something specific to say to each person something that applies to that person and to that person alone. The real content of God's speech or the real will of the person speaking of God is not in any sense then to be construed and reproduced by us as a general truth." End of quote. So the preacher is to go beyond presenting in words that the listeners can grasp the general truth spoken by God to humankind in general, in Jesus Christ, namely God with us. The preacher is to apply that general truth to the specific situations of the particular people before him. And by means of the preacher doing that, God does the same. God, God says something specific to these particular people. That specific thing having the status of being an application of what God says in Jesus Christ. Now, if Bart is to be taken literally here when he says that God says something specific to each person, and nowhere in the context does he give any indication that he's not to be taken literally, this just does not fit with the rest of what he has said about God speaking. <clears throat> 
If God literally says to a specific person how the word of God applies to him or her in their specific situation, then God is then and there saying a new thing. It's an application of what God says in Jesus Christ, but it's a new thing. The event of God saying that new particular thing is not identical with the event of the incarnation, obviously. Nor is its content identical with the general thing that God says in the incarnation. An application to a specific, specific situation is distinct from the generality of which it is the application. So here I think is at least one of the issues. When the preacher repeats and summarizes scripture, putting what the biblical writer said into terms that the congregation understands, we can interpret what he or she is doing as presenting what God said by way of the prophets and apostles. But suppose the preacher goes beyond repeating and summarizing what the prophets and apostles said. Suppose he, applies to, he or she applies, to, applies what they said to the lives of the people in front of him or her. In this going beyond, the preacher says something new. Should we, the congregants, should we regard this going beyond as the preacher now merely expressing his own opinion? That opinion to be taken seriously or not, as the case may be? Or should we regard it as God saying something to the congregants by way of the preacher's speech? They need not, that is the congregants, need not, indeed they should not regard whatever the preacher says as what God says. Calvin doesn't hesitate to point to the fallibility of preachers. But should they listen for what God is saying to them specifically by way of what the preacher says? Now, as everybody in this room knows, a good many of those who participate in the liturgy do in fact regard the preacher's going beyond what scripture says as a preacher simply expressing his own opinions. Annoyed by what the preacher says when applying scripture to their lives, they tell him to stick with preaching the gospel and stop inserting his personal opinions. And it has to be conceded that this is an understandable response to a good many sermons. But my view is that at this point, we should use Bart against Bart. Against the Bart who holds that God never says any, anything other than what God says to all humankind in Christ, namely God with us, I think we should use the Bart who says that God, quote, that God always has something specific to say to each human being, something that applies to that person and to that person alone. Be it granted that this comment by Bart occurs almost inadvertently in his text. But often what occurs inadvertently in a text is revealing, revelatory of chinks and cracks in the big scheme that the author has been seeking to impose. In the preceding lectures in this series, I argue that implicit in the Christian liturgy is the understanding of God who, as one who listens to us when we address God in our enactment of the liturgy. I think it would be strange indeed if God listened when we confessed the specific sins of our time and place, but did not then by way of the minister speaking words of absolution pro pronounce those same specific sins forgiven, but only issued of general God with us. God not only presently listens to us when we enact the liturgy, but also presently speaks to us by way of our enactment of the liturgy. Liturgy is the site of mutual address between God and God's people. The God of unsurpassable greatness and excellence bends down to listen to what we say to him in our enactment of the liturgy. That same God bends down by consenting to being represented by a mere human being in our enactment of the liturgy. So that what that human being says counts as God saying something 